This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Alvaro Barrington. Barrington is a London-based painter who uses a variety of materials in the production of his visionary art. His work takes on many forms, but always strives for cultural authenticity. In the conversation, we talk about his influences, his worldview, and his latest show up now through April 30th at Blum and Poe in LA. And now, the thoughts and philosophies of Alvaro Barrington. Thank you so much for joining me this week on uh, the ArtSense podcast. Alvaro, you know, a lot of times with artists, uh, I like to start kind of at the same place, and that's with the hypothetical. If you were to sit down at a dinner next to somebody at a dinner party who's never heard of you or seen your work, how would you describe it to them? Um, I try not to describe my work to people because I feel like there's, it, it, it's like a, uh, it does it a real big disservice. Although I went to art school and most of art school is like learning how to talk about your art. But it's 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 really interesting because it there's these sort of like different lines which is like philosophical, sometimes economical, like Marxist or whatever. There's all these sort of different lines that you go through in order to learn how to speak about art in art school, but I found that 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 doesn't, when I stand in front of any art, that really kind of doesn't do the art any real justice. And and that oftentimes become like, has been developed as a way for people to like start a conversation. So they'll look at an artwork and whatever lens they're looking at, they'll kind of uh, use, use that lens as the means of which to sort of like get into whatever interest that they have. Some artists that I talk to, their work's very recognizable. They're late career artists. They've been making things that look very similar for a long time. But my perception of you is that you're someone who likes to draw on a variety of cultural references and you like to experiment a lot with materials. And so the result of that is it's kind of hard to put your finger on something that looks like Alvaro's work because it feels like it's always changing. Would you agree with that? So, yeah. I, and I think part of it is because, you know, one of the, one of, one of the ways that I think about making is like thinking about how, about like the material condition of, of a place. And I remember it, it kind of started with like a, a writing that I read from Felix Gonzalez Torres, where he was talking about like these sort of um, minimalist sculptures from the '60s from like America, like, um, and he was sort of referencing that you know these these artists were sort of looking for a sense of universality when they were making minimalism and there was this idea that oh just if you bump into the sculpture that you are bumping into something universal and what what um Felix and Dallas Torres said was no the, you're basically that 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 sculpture was made from like like someone in the industrial who who's like on the winning side of the industrial revolution and so a lot of a lot of those sort of like big heavy like steel sculptures was easily accessible for someone who where that kind of production was affordable easily easily available and and so you know he kind of used like uh candies from the corner store the cheap 25 cent candy and and that was sort of his his sort of like what was available for him. But I always think about like if you're if I'm if I'm changing different subject matters or I'm addressing different ideas, then there's probably something materially that 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 can inform that. 
and so not just like um and so like if you look at some paintings from the caribbean maybe you know you have more access to burlap or hessian or like mm -hmm. you know cocoa sacks and if you're in the netherlands or new york or london you probably have access to you know you go to an art store and there's cotton there's you know what i mean you're going to find right. cotton or linen in the art store and so the ref, you know there's just um yeah so i just kind of think about when i'm addressing when i'm thinking through different ideas one one starting point is usually the material condition of a place well you know that that, that reminds me of of conversations I've heard where Mark Bradford talks about when he was first starting out, he was looking for something that was uh, affordable and accessible. And he had grown up in a hair salon and, um, you know, his family was into hairstyling and he got into it. And there are these, these little tissue paper, uh, like rice paper strips that they use whenever they're yep. setting curlers in like he would, he could get like a hundred or two hundred for like two dollars, and you know his first works. I mean, it was not; it was a matter of convenience, but it was also, as a, you know, in terms of like the materiality you're talking about, it it reflected his roots, right? Yeah. How has that manifested itself in your artwork before? Like, what is the material on hand that kind of speaks to? to you and in your culture and your work? I mean, I think first thing, yeah, I mean, Mark's a, Mark's a great example of someone. I mean, I, I also thought about him and, 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 and like uh, his, his, um, his advertisement, paper advertisement, but it also like you have the art, Italian Arte Povera. I think there's sort of like um, on a large scale, um, um, the default for, art making has become like standardized by by uh the northeast region who has kind of dominated the imagination of what a painter means mm -hmm. since like post-war america since like pollock the abex painters and so on so there's this sort of like default like kind of uh central centralizing idea of like oh these artists if you're a painter, these are sort of your default materials. But it's it's kind of interesting because even that if back then, um, you know, like artists like Franz Klein, a lot of the artists they used they use like house house paint, for example, mm -hmm. or Pollock used enamel. You know, so they were they were they were also using the materials that was localized to them. Um, but it just we kind of take it for granted because those become the standard because they became kind of the face of what we think about as a paint as, as painting or oil paint becomes like, you know, the, 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 the Dutch who was kind of the imperial, like the, the world power for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, before, before England, you know, they mastered oil paints. And so we kind of defaulted to oil paint being the standard of what we think about as, as paint material because the Dutch had kind of built their wealth on trade, right? And so they could get right. like materials from, they could get certain blues from Afghanistan or mm -hmm. other colors. And because they had kind of dominated trade, they were, they had access to, new materials that and they were able to like also paint like these beautiful flowers because they had access to new colors you know new material right. colors so yeah. i think i think yeah i think you know we kind of you know these things become like so uh like devoid of the context of which the, how those materials come to be in front of us that we kind of don't realize that, oh, these artists are speaking to the material condition. It only becomes like a bit shocking when it's like, you know, maybe otherized by race or gender or whatever, sure. or like may maybe not being from the Northeast. It, it, yeah. it also depends, I mean, to kind of get back to your point, I mean, I, I kind of embody, like I went to 
like I could easily embody like a, a Northeast artist. I went to all the schools out. I grew up in New York. I went to art schools. I, I went to MoMA. I think probably the first time I'd probably say is 12 years old or something like that. I can't really, you know. And so I went to school across the street from, you know, I'm a few minutes away from the mat and all these places. So I kind of grew up in the epicenter of it. So if I wanted to sort of default to these sort of material conditions, I can. But I also thought that it would it was maybe a bit too lazy and limiting for me to kind of frame myself within a very specific standard that was created 500 years ago. What you're saying reminds me of uh, of a personal anecdote. And as my my wife was telling me a story about how uh, her mom, whenever her mom would cook a ham, her mom would always cut off the end of the ham. And one time her, she asked her mom, like, why do you cut off the end of the ham? And it's like, well, that's the way we always did it growing up. Like, well, but why? And so her mom yeah. called her, her grandmother and said, hey, you're the one who taught me how to do this. Why Why do we always cut off the end of the ham? She said, because it, it, doesn't, it wouldn't fit in my pan otherwise. And so, mm. It, mm. so you know, the reason that there's this tradition started was for something very practical, which had nothing to do with the current state, right? And so, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, uh, our need to like work on, uh, you know, in tempera on panel or oil on canvas that really isn't necessary anymore. And so, why not work with concrete, right? Yeah. Or any of the, I mean, I think modernism has kind of always been, I mean, the history of art has always been like, why not work with the thing that's in front of you? <laughs> right. But I think, but I do think like, you know, as certain things become like um, codified mm -hmm. and loses its kind of that sort of origin story, oh, it doesn't fit in the pot anymore, then, then, then we, um, you know, it just becomes like a default law that people, you know, it's like, like you'll m bump into someone and say, oh, you make paintings? What do you use? Oil or acrylic? Right. And I could tell that's because they, they went to art school or they did an art class and the professor or the lecturer sat in front of them and said, oh, if you're, if you're a painter, you use oil or acrylic. And that kind of becomes like, you know, like the lazy entry into making paintings. But but um, I think people who've made paintings for thousands of years, it also kind of creates this weird hierarchy because it also like centralizes, if you think of painting as being oil or acrylic, what it does is that it starts painting as a, at a very sp particular period, right? Mm -hmm. Because it means that anything else that doesn't, that hasn't made, you know, didn't put oil or acrylic doesn't in your imagination get qualified as as a painting you know and I, I, then you go like well what if matisse or the modernist painters weren't looking at japanese prints right <laughs> you know like yeah <laughs> no, yeah, and, and I think it's you know it's it's a really interesting conversation because I feel like there's a changing hierarchy in art and i feel like sculpture it has really risen in the ranks in terms of its uh, respect in in the hierarchy and so that you know the acceptance of of sculpture being close to the top of the hierarchy kind of opens us up to appreciating a whole different set of of materials versus you know oil and oil or acrylic right yeah i mean i guess i guess the word hierarchy is interesting to me because i don't necessarily i think that's also part of the false narrative that we've gotten you right. know art is really about how we engage our 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 lived experience and how do we how do we find like uh truth and how do we find community and i think and and how do we find someone else's truth or another culture's truth, or another person, and that could happen through like singing, or dance, or or a, 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 an interesting conversation, 
I mean, I think that's kind of the history of what modernism ended up kind of breaking apart of what does it mean, what does art really mean? And I think one way is a sort of dogmatic way that like a Greenbergian dogmatic way of saying, oh, here we've deconstructed painting to like very specific objects. Or I think a larger kind of John Dewey, Alan Capra kind of like philosophy is like, it, it, it just opens up about a sense of being and how we were able to like find community or find conversation or find things you know, we're all like subjective beings who are essentially alone in the world. And we're born alone and we, we kind of live in our own heads, but there's ways of which like tools that we're given, senses that we're given to sort of help us find community and relate and connect to each other. And I kind of think those things can happen through like you making an incredibly moving sculpture that engages your body, that engages your sense of scale, or it could be a, it could be a voice note, or it could be any you know it could be anything. But I think that's kind of where where where. Um, but I think the market systems kind of create like false sense of 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 uh, and maybe our need to categorize things create false sense of like hierarchies. But there is no real hierarchy in. You know, this is what's valuable to you. And there's hierarchies to us personally. But, you know, like maybe our parents or our siblings or, you know, certain conversations or certain moments in our, our lives with our partners. But I don't know if I really, but I, I the, the sculpture question to your point is really interesting because I, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's really, I don't really pay too much attention to sculpture, like the way I pay attention to painting, because I, I, I just have like a, my ins, my like core being is kind of sits, like sits, like there's something that sitting in front of a work, in, in front of a painting does to me. Mm -hmm. Although I will say I was, it's interesting, I was at the um, Pinot collection and um the two most powerful rooms, it was like an Urs Fisher room and a David Hammond's and they were kind of right next to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think those, you know, and, and they were mostly sculptures or what we would consider sculptures. And I was so moved by those that by the time I went to see the paintings by like my favorite painters, I just kind of felt it really un uninspiring. It was just something that Urs did with space and I think it could have been because I'd been like locked into a, a, a I was in a flat, I was in an apartment for two years. Right. So by the time I went, something that engaged my body in this physical way kind of really like shook me because it was only like a handful of people I was seeing for so long that, that now all of a sudden this thing engaged my body in a way that I hadn't felt activated you know I just like I had to walk around it and then also seeing these bodies of candles burning and then you go you go and you see the Hammonds and you have to like yeah it's just I don't know there's just something about it your work you know especially this this most recent body of work they're objects you know they're on the wall so they're it's you're not going to call it um a, a painting but it's um you're not going to call it a sculpture you, you could call it a high relief um yeah. but you know you're you're making objects right and so yeah. you're you're not you're not bounding yourself by some preconceived definition of of what that can be or could be right yeah back there in what you were, we were talking about a moment ago about a hierarchy you, you started talking about value I know that you read a lot of work by a particular economist, Mariana Mazzucato. I think she she talks a lot about value, right? Value extraction yeah. versus value creation. What what about that narrative attracts you to uh, her thought and philosophy from a from an economics perspective? Um, I kind of stumbled onto her during the pa during the pandemic. I forgot how, but you know, I think one of the things one of the ways that art serves me is, 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 is kind of about questioning 
the wor- the world that we inherited. You know, as a maybe as a kid, my I would ask my parent. I was like a very curious kid, but I would ask my parents and the family and my family members like, oh, oh, hey, what? Who was very religious and went all, all kind of went to church, and I would go, hey, what's going on with that? And they would just say, oh, it's God's will, and that always felt like really just like I don't know, just like didn't make sense to me Mm -hmm. and so i became really curious about like why are things the way it is and yeah manuela doesn't uh uh she doesn't talk about it from like uh an arts perspective but just in terms of like what value creation and how we understand it today from maybe in terms of like the value of apple and one of the things that she sort of talked about that I thought was really important in terms of art was um, like, you know, like Apple's easy to pick on, but it's like an easy kind of talking point, but you know, it's a, it's, it's a a worth hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And the way we kind of imagine Apple as a company is that, you know, here you have Steve Jobs who had this sort of passionate idea and and made this product, right? And that we all love. And how Mariana kind of talked about it was was that A, you had and and this is you have basically taxpayer dollars, which is basically our dollars, which was given which was sort of given to the government and the government used those taxpayer dollars to fund huge amounts of, of like innovate, innovative research. And then a company like Apple would come in after all the sort of research and development and all the risk had been done from our collective tax dollars. Then they would come in and they would sort of ma- figure out a product that made it profitable for the company so that the company would have all of the rewards and that's so much of the risk. And, um, but it was interesting because she kind of talked about it from an economics point point of like, these are our tax dollars that are, that are given, that are giving these industries the money to, to sort of perform or, you know, Elon Musk getting, uh, Tesla getting, m- billions of tax dollars from its original inception Mm -hmm. to start up. You know, we never really think about, oh, you got this huge money or your, or the technology, the touch technology, all kind of is, is invested by taxpayer dollars. And so, you know, she, she was sort of talking, talking about these things from like, if we shift the narrative of these sort of individual like creative geniuses to a collective value creation that we are all financially giving, given to, that maybe we can fix some of these sort of social and, and economic uh, um, issues that we're bumping into. And um, so I really appreciated that. But I think in terms of where it kind of connected with me for art was that there has been, you know, for a very long period, and I've kind of said this several times before, but for a very long period, you, I mean, you always kind of had academic art, meaning like someone who trained at, under someone. So whether you go back to Michelangelo or, or Caravaggio studio or whatever, you always had artists who were kind of um, came under who was, what they call trained or whatever right in a certain thing but for for a long period of time there was artists and for much of the 20th century and 21st century and 18th century probably artists kind of was looked at as people who were sort of formed within larger cultural conversations and they were talking about modern life they were talking about what we experienced and how we experienced it and so like um, you know, like, so Bas, you know, Warhol's a perfect example of someone who was like, um, 
you know, started Interview Magazine and was in Studio 54 and was partying with Mick Jagger and Bianca Jagger. And like, they were kind of part of the, the scene of how we understood the disco era. Right. And, and Basquiat was like, you know, Data Madonna, who's arguably the most important female or m- musician of, our, of the last 40 years. Right. And he's with Blondie and he's in the there at the beginning of of hip hop. And so artists were sort of looked at as the makers in in sort of cultural moments. And over the last couple decades, I think maybe since like the early 2000s, what you've had is a sort of understanding that artists or are like at least on the market level. Right. Is that there's an the understanding has been that artists have to come out of. Uh, very particular MFA programs. Mm. And so what it means is that like the art world has sort of become reflective of, of, of being only academic art being reflected in art in, in in the art market, which I think means that like all of the other cultural voices uh, ends up getting missed out. And I think that's a big problem. And it, it creates like larger problems where you kind of have like, in, 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 including with many different professions, like, you know, in order to be a journalist, you know, like the idea of freedom of the press, which is so ingrained in American psychology, meant that anybody could write about any subject matter that that you felt that you had some sort of curiosity and knowledge and now sort of becoming journalist means that you almost exclusively has to have to have went to journalism school, which also means that you had a very, 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 very particular lens that was given to you or fed to you or that you've inherited or adapted in how to understand the world, which means that if we're getting all our news sources from a very particular lens that doesn't necessarily connect to our neighbors, way of seeing because maybe our neighbors didn't go to Yale or Harvard, right? Right. That they don't necessarily see themselves or their, or their way of understanding the world mirrored in the news and their truths no longer get, like they, they get, they, they get, they start feeling like they're gaslit. And then you have someone like Donald Trump comes in and says, these, the news as fake media and because you've looked at the news for so long and it just hasn't really reflected what's happening in your neck of the woods you just start believing like yeah this is fake media and so then you start then it starts having a a distrust an unraveling of distrust on all sorts of levels in your institutions and things that kind of keep things going. Right. And, 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 and it's because it's all about like the sort of professionalization that's been happening and that in, in, in almost all aspects of like, of, of life. So what, what I'm hearing in there somewhere, Alvaro, is that it sounds like you really question the authenticity of a lot of the art in the art world that uh, it sounds like the art that is being produced, that's coming out of particular programs, uh, it's all very self-serving. And I've, I've heard uh, people talk about this before, that they can recognize people who got an MFA from CalArts. They can recognize somebody that went and got their MFA from a particular school because the people that come out of there have a particular look. And that's it sounds like that's all pretty self-serving. So it sounds like you're saying that there should be room for unique expressive thought that reflects your culture and and who you are specifically versus what academia wants to fit you in. Is that fair? Um, no, I wouldn't say, I, I, no, not really, because I think like for me, the value of art is, le- is learning how other people live their life so that I can have a larger understanding. So like, you know, like, I I mean, I kind of said this example a few times before, but, you know, I grew up, I grew up like a black kid in Brooklyn, but it wasn't until I went to, I had like 
close friends who really loved Nirvana, who was from like the suburbs, that I got like their understanding of that anxiety and that kind of mistrust that I understood what they were coming from because I was listening to the music and there was something about how the music spoke their truth that I said, oh, oh, I get it. And even in hip hop, it was like, you know, I'd never been to the West Coast before, but when I heard Snoop and Dr. Dre, I, you know, New York City is, is train culture. Everybody gets on the train. And so the music is sort of meant for you to sit on the train. So if you really listen to Nas, or Jay-Z, or a lot of those rappers, it was, the, the, the rhythm in the music was about sitting on a train and getting in your head. But if you listen to like Dre and Snoop, it, it was about driving in your car and going somewhere. And so it was about a different kind of way of being. In LA, it was like, in New York, you kind of time your movement based on the schedules of the train. In LA, you time your movements based on like your ability to get in a car. And so a whole different psychology develops. And you kind of understand that when you really kind of listen to how the music is organized and the brilliance of how the music is organized. And so for me, turning to art is about how, like, you see a particular place. So if I look at, like, a, like a Seurat painting or a French painting, I get the light in the south of France from seeing a Seurat painting hmm. before I even went to the South of France. And then I went to the South of France and I said, oh my God, this is a Seurat painting. Right. <laughs> you know, it was just like, but I think what happens with art is like if the only truths that you get come out of Yale or Cal Arts, then that leaves a whole bunch of other truths that don't get to be visible. And so it's not... I, I actually like love that you get the arts of the year. And I think those are important. I think academic art, you know, like I look at students of Caravaggio and I go, wow, that's so great. Right. Or the students of, but it also does it. It's not the only aspect of that period that I want to find to be, that I want my truth to come from. And so when you have like only single sources being defining what truth looks like, I think that creates huge amount of cultural problems. Sure. And so it's not, yeah, it's not like, oh, these kids are, because a lot of my friends went to Yale and went to these places, and I love those, and I, I you know, I very much consider myself an academic painter um, in, in a very particular sense, but I, I have, like, the duality of, like, maybe having grown up in probably the most visible music culture of the last 40 years, which is like hip hop coming out of New York City. You know, there was probably no other genre. So I have like the duality of understanding how that sort of culture has informed how I dress, how millions of people dress, how, um, how we walk, how we understand ourselves, how we understand our bodies. But I also know like, oh, in, in Seattle, there was a whole different type of culture being formed. And that came because art was sort of expansive. And it wasn't that you needed an MFA, a very expensive MFA. MFA. And I think if we decide that the only people we listen to is people who have an MFA, and, and that includes like any sort of sense, you know, uh, any kind of truth, then I think it just creates like huge cultural problems. Well, it, it's going to create holes, right? But it, it yeah. sounds like this is a great segue into conversation about your your current show that's up at Blum and Poe, because that's it's in dialogue with those things that you just described, right? Yes. Can you kind of give us a, an overview of that show? I, in, in my mind, there's there's probably a little bit of nostalgia there. It looks like you're looking at hip hop, late 90s, early 2000s, as kind of a seed for, you know, its impact on a culture, its, you know, communicating a feel 
it, you're probably it's probably better coming from your words than mine, right? Yeah, I think I think mostly, you know, I think how we how we narratives are really important. Um, emotional narratives, cultural narratives, like narratives, kind of determine who we care about, right, and who we don't care about, and and who we find empathy to, and who we don't find like, and they're like the 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 like kind of running line nowadays in like the liberal circle that I see on Instagram is like, like, Oh, we care about Ukraine, but what was, where's the conversation about Palestine or, or Yemen. So, but either way, I mean, just to sort of get back to the show, I think like, I mean, I grew up in a, I grew up in a, in a particular era that I find that, that I, I just never felt, I felt like very few places really told real stories about what happened in in my neighborhood in my, in in the neighborhood and um and I'm nearly 40 now that that period is quite some time away but I think we still live in very much in the legacies of the 90s and I kind of just wanted to understand what that culture was that I was sort of inheriting or living in and there's like a period there's like one painting that's like it's actually it's really interesting because like like it, and this is sort of the backdrop of the painting but it was sort of the think logic of the painting so like there's picasso's sort of return to classicism which people kind of always turn kind of looked at like a break away from yeah like the sort of return to neoclass neoclassical sculpture but what i what really kind of dawned on me in the last two years and looking at it, and if you go to art school, it almost devoids it out of any kind of cultural context. It just was like, this is Picasso deciding to return to like his European roots after a period of like exploring uh, African mask. And that's kind of the narrative that we inherit from that moment. And there was just a period, I forgot what happened, but I stumbled onto one of those paintings like recently, like a year, like right after the pandemic, I'd went to Paris and I saw them and immediately there was something about like the heaviness of the bodies that I completely understood in the context of a guy who, when he started making those paintings, the, the, the world had just went through the Spanish flu, and of course, Picasso's Spaniard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just this heaviness of the bodies. Because when he's painting these, when he's painting these bodies, if you look at a, if you look at like a sculpture, like he starts drawing these Roman sculptures because they look heavy. And then he, the bodies ended up starting to feel heavy. And I was like, how is this guy not affected by, like, millions of people dying around him mm. and two world wars? And maybe this was his way of sort of injecting that heaviness of people in the 1920s in a period of celebration. That was, this was his way of looking at that moment. Because there's no way you could, you know, I mean, the Spanish flu was, like, right in his backyard. He's Spanish. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. And so like this sort of, it kind of really blew my mind that you go through education and you never really shared it, that, that aspect of life. Because if you did, then, then I think if a lot of us who studied art history would have been much more like ready for the psychological impacts of COVID and, 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 and the lockdown and the deaths and all of that, right? Because it would have been like, oh, we've been here in history before. And here's how artists have addressed it. And it sort of removed itself from the context. But I thought, yeah, I looked at those bodies. Anyway, I made this painting because I wanted to start painting sculpture. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and so I, I found this like rose that was like a metallic, a metal sculpture. And then I, and then I painted it. And then I came to LA and it was like, oh, 25 years ago, it was this Buffy, it was this Buffy the Vampire Slayer magazine at the Target. And it was like, oh, 25 years of Buffy. 
It was like one of these fanzines and immediately brought me back to like watching Buffy and being a kid watching Buffy. And it was so interesting because then also like this same week, the same week that Buffy premiered, uh, Biggie had passed, uh, had gotten like taken away. And so it was really interesting. Like it also became the moment where Biggie became like immortalized as like, uh, as a god in, in within the culture because he, he no longer was here and he became like this sort of like heavy being because we also he, there his death was so untimely it was like tied to so much of like of of what at the at the period got like presented by the media quite like falsely for 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 their own financial gain as a kind of war between the East Coast and the West Coast. And so, and then when Biggie, who became a sort of like uh, victim of this war, um, you know, I just thought like, oh yeah, here's this like sculpture painting. And, um, and also it was like the week that Buffy came out. So I thought it was, so then I cut up like a little fan. There's a, like the LA artist, Richard Hawkins, mm -hmm. who do like these, these are incredible like like fan type paintings that feel very LA, feel very much of like a period of like Leonardo DiCaprio fandom moment. You know, it's right. like it's like, oh yeah, this is like soup. It's like you just you see a Richard Hawkins and immediately I'm like brought back to like this ultimate peak of a certain type of celebrity, a certain age of celebrity. You know, we live in a different age of celebrity now. That's like TikTok stars and whatever. Right. But there's a certain age of like 90s, early 2000 Hollywood celebrity. And then this is like cutting out of like these fanzines. And I just thought, oh man, that's so exciting. Like I need to just do that, you know. And it just was like a weird way of like balancing like such a heavy loss of Biggie with like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. T tell me about uh, about this particular show at Bloom and Poe because you know when I look at the works, it's not just your work. There, it's almost like you've curated some other artists to be on the wall, kind of in conversation with you around this this theme. Am I saying that right? I mean, how did how did you choose this other work that is included? Yeah, I guess one of the ways that I looked at it was or how I wanted to put the show together was like this idea of like if I was putting an album together because mm -hmm. I was much more as a as a kid I was much more aware of like how a, how a, how a cassette tape like an artist put a cassette tape out because the idea was like you a cassette or a record because back then you still had like you know CDs kind of came on much became a thing like in the mid 90s 98 like much a bit later, but like in the early, early nineties, you still had like records and you still had like mixed had cassette tapes, tapes mixtapes or cassette tapes. Yeah. And so when, a, when an album came out, it was really kind of meant for you to listen to it through two sides, like the whole way through side A and side B. And, um, and, but on a cassette, you would have like interludes, right? You would have like an artist, who maybe had their mama speaking or like on Lauren Hill's uh, um, miseducation, you have like, there was this interlude of like her, of someone asking a classroom of kids, what does love mean for them? And so you always, it was like always interesting because it gave you a sense of the artist's world in like a larger sense, the musician's world in a larger sense. And so I really wanted to like make an album. I think curate is, is like more, I mean, I am operating in the art and like the art world, but I thought, you know, I'd rather like try to learn from the lessons in, in my life. And this was like one of them It's like, oh yeah, if you listen to a record, then you hear like these interludes. And so it was really interesting to have like, Aya's interlude, who, who's really just making these incredibly beautiful drawings of um, Missy and Little Kim and 
yeah, Missy, yeah, there's a Missy, Lil' Kim, and Lauren Hill. Mm-hmm. But just the, there's just a tenderness in how she draws that reminds me of like if you're like if you went to art school in 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 New York, uh, I went to this art school called LaGuardia, and it was like mm-hmm. LaGuardia and Cooper Union kids like all had this very particular way of drawing right. that I really loved. I mean, I I didn't do art even though I went to art school, but I, if I did draw, that would have been like how they drew. And I just really felt like placing her in this room that felt like if you know that language, you know, like, oh, this is like a way that a New Yorker draws, a New wow. York kid draws. And so it's just sort of looking at that. And then and then there's a um, Paul Anthony Smith interlude, and he's sort of like, you know, he's he's Jamaican, but lives in New York and the West Indian culture and hip hop, you know, Biggie, but like, uh, it was formed um, by like a Jamaican who uh, cool her who went up from Jamaica to the South Bronx. Biggie's mom was Jamaican, you know. So there's this influence of Jamaican culture in what we understood a West Indian culture in like New York, especially. And so there's like uh, there's some scenes of carnival of photographs in there that I really thought was beautiful. There's a Teresa Farrell, who's like one of my best friends, we make a lot of art together. Um, and she just had like this punk rock moment. But there was this period in the early, in the 90s, where like the two most rebellious c- culture was like punk rock and hip hop. And they were just like both like, it just showed that you were like counterculture if you were like heavy into punk rock. Right. You know, like tatted up. <laughs> you know, like punks right. were like, you know, and just like, and, um, and, and also like, there was always like large conversation between, you know, like, I think one of the biggest breakout moments was like when Aerosmith and Run DMC did, did they song together. There's always been like a kind of moment of rock, punk rock, hip hop. So there's a Teresa Farrell inter- interlude that's in there because I just thought like, oh yeah, this is like, you know, um yeah this is this and then there's and then there's a, a jasmine um interlude where she's just like which is kind of what it's not an interlude but but that's a whole other story and i don't know if we have the time but <laughs> yeah you know i i think i think i have just about taken up all the time that that I asked for, but uh, Avara, I, I really feel like uh, I could talk to you for another hour. That you you seem like a real thinker, and I feel like we could just uh, maybe maybe I have to have you back on sometime. And so yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. But uh, you Next know, show. I, I really I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate your time today. And so the the show you know that we've been talking about is is up at uh, Blum and Poe in Los Angeles for a while, right? I think it ends April 30th. I okay. Think. All right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll link to that on the, the page. I Again, I, I really appreciate how gracious you've been with your time and just being willing to to talk about your your inspirations and your inputs and, and uh, how you think. And, you know, I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you today. No, thank you so much. Thank you. This was, it was good to put my words out there. These are just like underlying thoughts that sort of help the show, but I haven't really said it so much right. it, out loud. So now we're t- saying it out loud. I hope it makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. All right. You have a great day. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. Thank you.